The first thing to remember about Burling is that he is not a real person. He is a construct put together by Priestley to discredit the views of capitalism. Because Priestley's message is a socialist one. One of the striking things about uh, his first speech is this idea that he's talking to Gerald without any pretenses, suggesting that normally he hides things, normally he is pretending. And this seems to be an accusation levelled at the upper classes. Similarly revealing is this idea of what Sheila is worth. She means a tremendous lot to me. And we might think of this as simply a demonstration of his affection. But this word lot is also got some financial implications, which, as, you, as we will see, um, is the way in which Burling thinks of his daughter and her marriage. His language also reveals uh, the role of genders in this upper class. Sheila's role is to make Gerald happy. Uh, that's her function as a wife. And then this addition of, and I'm sure you'll make her happy, actually introduces doubt. It's not essential to Burling that Gerald will make Sheila happy. And of course there is evidence that um, he hasn't made her happy, as she refers to the fact of his absence um, during the summer. So Burling must have seen his daughter unhappy at her relationship with Gerald, but he glosses this over. I'm sure you'll make her happy. In other words, Gerald is more important to him than Sheila's happiness. And the reason for that is revealed next. He is the kind of son-in-law that uh, Burling always wanted. Why? Because he's connected to business. Uh, so Gerald's father is a friendly rival in business. And we can see now that Burling is thinking of an alliance between his own business and that of Gerald's parents. Burling also assumes that Gerald sees things the same way. Now you've brought us together, and us being Crofts Limited and Burling and Company, he sees Gerald actively seeking a business arrangement. He understands that Gerald is interested in Sheila not just for herself, but for the financial security she can bring in the alliance between these two companies. And then finally, Burling's hope is that by working together they can lower costs and higher prices. Lowering costs, of course, means paying lower wages. Uh, this is a monopoly. It's something that's not allowed in our, our current system because it's immoral. If businesses get together and can control... Uh, both what they pay and what they charge, then everyone becomes exploited. The customer through higher prices and the workers through lower wages. And uh, Priestley does this to try and show that the end game of capitalism, the whole point of capitalism, is to make as much money as, as possible. And therefore, all capitalism is based on exploitation and it's geared towards trying to gain a monopoly. Now, in most countries, this is illegal, but it's something that still goes on today. Uh, for example, most computers run on Microsoft. Microsoft have a near monopoly on the kind of programs that people use. Once Priestley has established that Burling represents the capitalist ruling class, he then sets about ridiculing him. He does this through dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is where the audience knows something that the characters speaking don't know. And in this case, it's history. The play is set in 1912, but performed in 1945. So the audience know everything that's happened in those intervening years. So when Burling says that it's going to be a very good time, and soon it will be an even better time, the audience can clearly see this is ridiculous. The First World War happens two years later. And after the First World War, there is incredible industrial unrest. Uh, there are a series of national strikes um, in the 20s, and the whole country is paralysed in 1926. There's the Great Depression of 1929, and uh, the only thing that helps countries recover from that is actually war.
he dismisses um, these concerns as wild talk, which of course then makes him seem ridiculous. And then there's this quite subtle pun here about possible labour trouble. Labour here means workers. But of course in 1945 there's further labour trouble in that the Labour Party is going to be swept to a landslide victory, ousting the Conservatives and, if you like, the capitalists. There are two ways of interpreting his final uh, sentence here, and we're in for a time of steadily increasing prosperity. So uh, capitalists like Mr Burling, the owners of manufacturing businesses, did indeed see great rises in profits, but these were often wiped out uh, by the Great Depression that started in 1929 because people couldn't afford to buy the goods that they manufactured. Uh, but another way of looking at this is, is actually for Priestley to be looking back in 1945 and saying, God, look at all the suffering um, of millions of young men killed in two world wars. Who has gained? Actually, big business has. Big business is still making lots of money. Because, of course, the manufacturing industry made tremendous amounts of money out of the war, building for the war effort. And perhaps another criticism that uh, Priestley levels at capitalism through Berlin is this idea that uh, capitalists think they understand human nature. Berlin expresses it like this. People have everything to lose and nothing to gain by war, and therefore war won't happen. People have just got too much invested in peacetime. But human nature isn't like that. It's also deeply emotional. So a speech or two from um, the leader of a country actually can make a massive difference to the population. But another criticism here could be that Berlin doesn't quite understand capitalism. One way of looking at war is to think of it as the logical solution to capitalism. So, for example, uh, capitalism is breaking down during the Great Depression because people are too poor to buy goods that businesses are manufacturing and therefore the rich are becoming less rich. Well, what's the solution? The solution is war. Once you start a war, everybody then has to start manufacturing and consuming. And in fact, war consumes an incredible amount of raw materials because you're creating things that are going to be destroyed and therefore renewed. This is the very model of capitalism. And Berlin is also getting at that. War is the logical conclusion of capitalism. Therefore, if you want to get rid of war, you've got to get rid of capitalism. And to do that, you need an alternative way of working, way of being together. And that is the community and its socialism. It's very easy to see how Berlin is being ridiculed when he says, and I say there isn't a chance of war, and yet two world wars are coming, as the audience knows. But Priestley also wants to make the point that capitalists themselves don't realise the horror, if you like, of the powers they're unleashing through business. So Berlin is quite right here when he says, in a year or two, We'll have aeroplanes that will be able to go anywhere, and automobiles, and then ships. And he's quite right. But the irony here is that these very things make war more efficient to export. War can then go anywhere. Again, Priestley is making the point that the logical end of capitalism is war. The point of the reference to the Titanic is, of course, to ridicule Berlin further. And this is the idea of hubris, pride before the fall, thinking that you're much better than you are. And so the Titanic is billed as unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. And you could see this as a metaphor for what Priestley hopes the ruling classes are. They see themselves as unsinkable, all-powerful, but actually he's determined to sink them. In order to ridicule Berlin still further, um, he gets Berlin to imagine this time in 1940 when there's going to be a party and everything is going to be prosperous and well. 1940 is in fact the low point 
for Britain during the war. They're having the Blitz, where the Germans are able to bomb the country at night, almost um, without any kind of defence. Uh, it's after Dunkirk, where the British army have been uh, fought out of France and, and had a humiliating defeat, having to return home. And it's just before America enters the war, and so the British feel entirely alone. At this point, many people feared that they wouldn't win. He then gives Burling's words uh, some alliteration to further ridicule him. There'll be peace and prosperity and progress, all things that will be conspicuously absent in 1940. And so Burling is describing a world which is fantasy. The opposite is actually the case in 1940. And this is very, very recent memory to his audience in 1945. And then there is a final joke for his first audience. Uh, the play is first performed in Russia. And so he has this line, except, of course, in Russia, which will always be behindhand naturally. And the Russians, of course, would see themselves as an incredibly successful nation. And for Priestley, uh, Russia is a very successful nation because it's taken socialism to its logical conclusion in communism. However, selling communism to the British masses would be much harder, and therefore Priestley only references it here very subtly. His real message in the play is socialism. The next method Priestley uses to discredit Berlin is this idea of ironic foreshadowing. So as he tells Gerald that uh, he thinks he's in line for a knighthood, uh, he has this rider. So long as we behave ourselves, don't get into the police court or start a scandal, which is precisely what's going to happen in the rest of the play with the visit of the inspector and the scandal that, at the very least, is Eric stealing from his father, and at worst, is the part the family played in the death of Eva Smith. This is brought home to us very deliberately by the stage instruction. Uh, it's unusual for a playwright to say quite so precisely what the actors must do, so we would expect the stage, uh, the stage direction, the Burling might laugh here, or simply there might not be any stage instruction, but here it has to be complacent, so the audience can see Burling is self-satisfied, which brings us back to this idea of hubris, and also returns us to the fact that Priestley wants to make a villain of Burling because he wants to make a villain of capitalism. <laughs>